this section is about static code analysis, um, what that means. I've been involved with doing this as a user for about 25 years or so, um, building mostly critical systems. Um, but I've also been involved with building tools and trying to sell them to people and also been doing stuff like programming language design uh, for this stuff. So I've kind of had various roles. Um, what I hope to do today is along these lines, I'll tell you what this thing is called static analysis, just to make sure we're all on the same page. Um, probably try and tell you what it isn't as well. Um, I'll tell you why you might bother with wanting to do this at all, uh, why it's a good idea. I'll tell you about the goals that we would like. So if you could have a perfect static analysis tool, what would it look like? Um, I will then tell you why that's actually impossible uh, and you can't have that uh, and the reasons why. I'll look at some of the different ways these technologies get deployed in terms of the modes of use, um, and the way we've seen people use these things, and also in terms of depth. I mean, what can you actually get out of these tools um, from the very trivial kind of stuff you, you might do all the way up to the really advanced stuff that we do for the most sort of safety or security critical systems. I'll then give you a desperately incomplete a few examples of some um, tools that are out there that you might be able to try if people are curious and some of the programming languages that are associated with them. And then, of course, as I always do with talks, I will set you all some homework so you, you actually go away from today with something to do um, rather than just forgetting everything you've heard. Okay, um, so static analysis, obviously, is basically it's the opposite of dynamic analysis, which sounds like a, a blindingly obvious thing to say. So dynamic analysis is verification of stuff like software that's based on observation. So basically, you build something, you run it, and you see if it works. Um, so that's dynamic because you're observing the thing working. So basically all forms of, of testing or, or simulation fall into this category of dynamic analysis. Um, so the opposite of that is static analysis. So what that really means is the hopefully mathematical or, or manual analysis of stuff that we've built, but without executing it or running it, if you like. So it's basically not testing. Um, say design artifacts because it could be code um, like programming stuff but it could be so-called models I don't know if any of you use things like MATLAB Simulink or Mathematica um, or some of these higher level domain domain specific tools it could be models it could be designs it could be stuff expressed in the UML uh, kind of model or something like that so it, it's not necessarily all about code and static analysis also includes manual um, people-driven stuff, like just peer review, and the kinds of stuff we're supposed to do with reviewing each other's work. Fine, that's a form of static analysis, because looking at someone's code, he's not running it, you're just checking it by hand. Um, but today, for the purposes of this half an hour, to try and keep this to half an hour and not six hours, I want to try and stick to the, the automated, tool-based, computer-based analysis of code, so actual software stuff that we've written and we want to, to run on computers, because that's kind of an easy thing that I guess people are most familiar with or, or most associate this kind of technology with. Okay, so why bother with this kind of technology? Well, it's, it's pretty easy, really. Um, one thing you can do with static analysis is to, if you get it right, you can prevent certain classes of defect from being in your software absolutely entirely. You can just say, that's done. This kind of bug cannot happen because some tool has said, okay, this, this bug is absent from my stuff. So, Prevention is a good thing, and if you do it right, you can really get rid of some defects completely. Um, doing analysis statically also means you typically get to find defects sooner rather than later, and that's a good thing, because software engineering economics says, if I can fix a bug sooner rather than later, I save a ton of money, something like one or two orders of magnitude. Um, it costs an awful lot of money to put bugs into the field and ship a million devices, and then discover their crap and have to recall a million units. Um, ask the car manufacturers what it costs um, to recall lots and lots of vehicles. Um, it's an awful lot cheaper to get rid of defects earlier in the life cycle. Um, so fixing bugs now saves you money and you get a better product um, out of the process. So there is a kind of natural alignment there that's good. Um, and also what we can do is if we're really confident that the static analysis has eliminated certain classes of defects, then what we can actually do is just stop testing for those defects completely. So imagine if I had a tool which definitely always finds all the buffer overflows in my code. If I had a tool that could do that statically, then maybe I just don't bother testing for buffer overflows ever again in my code base. Uh, and that just saves me a bucket of money. And the people that would be doing that, maybe they can be doing development instead. So I get better productivity as well. 
Um, and this is this is obvious. I mean, all mature engineering disciplines do this. Electronics, or civil engineering, or structural engineering are all based on this kind of mathematical analysis. Um, we don't build aircraft by putting them in wind tunnels anymore. They all just design in a computer and aerodynamicists and do computational fluid dynamics and this kind of stuff. Um, we don't build models and test them. We don't build bridges by building them and then getting people to walk on them and see if they fall over. Um, but that seems to be the way we build a lot of software, which is a bit worrying. Um, so the goals for an analysis facility, I suppose, what would I like? So, dear Santa, ah, yes, for Christmas, I want a static analysis tool which has the following five properties. This is what we vaguely in the business, or at least here, we call the big five goals. Um, so, I want a tool which is said to be sound. This is a mathematician's way of saying that a tool with, that reports zero false negatives. So, a false negative is where, the, where you say to the tool, does my program have a bug? The tool says no, which is negative, but it's lying to you. There is a bug, but it's failed to find you, or it's just lied to you. Um, so false negatives are bad, because you think everything's fine, and it ain't fine. You've got bugs. So a sound tool has zero false negatives. That's very, very important. The flip side of that is what we, and again, a mathemat uh, we'll come back to this term completeness in a minute, but the absence of the false positive is called completeness. So if there's no bug in your code, but the tool says, warning, there might be a bug in your code, but it's not a really a bug, that's just really annoying, and that's what's called a false positive. But we don't like those because they waste our time. Um, thirdly, I want a tool which is deep, um, meaning it tells me really useful, interesting, um, non-trivial stuff about my code. Um, I can really easily build a perfect tool that will... Uh, assess the indenting of my code. You know, have I indented my three spaces or four spaces? And have I put my curly brackets like Kernigan and Ritchie, or have I put my curly brackets like the ISO standard? Um, and have I not, you know, have I, um, um, you know, not used the, the tab character? Um, obviously, that's trivial. It's important, but trivial. Not very interesting. I'm interested in stuff like buffer overflows, arithmetic overflow, and then much more subtle security properties and safety properties, like good stuff always happens and bad things never happen. That's the stuff I'm really interested in verifying about my code. Fourth, I want a tool that's fast. I want a tool that's so fast I can put it in the hands of my developers and they will use it right now before they commit their stuff to the CM system. We want this analysis to be a pre-commit activity. Um, we also put the analysis in our integration, in our continuous integration engine or pipeline or whatever, but actually what I really want to do is push this onto the developers' desktops. So it's a pre-commit activity for them. To, for it to be a pre-commit activity, it's got to be so fast, they'll do it right now, and it's got to be faster than testing. Otherwise, well, go figure, they'll test first. If it's quick, if it's sort of, you get a, a quick fix from testing, they'll do the testing. We want to make the analysis so quick that it becomes preferable to see if it works by testing. And finally, this, this thing called modularity basically means that I can analyze a small bit of a program and I know that the analysis is okay, uh, and I don't have to analyze the whole program, um, because typically analyzing the whole program is very slow. And also, when do you have the whole program? Well, hardly ever, because you haven't finished it yet. Um, so I want to be able to analyze programs as I go along when they're incomplete, and that's really important. So easy, huh? I just build a tool that does all five of those things. Um, well, tough luck. You can't have that. Santa says, no, tough, you can't have that for Christmas. You can have about three and a half of those five goals. Um, I'll turn to you why in a minute. Um, and you don't even get to pick. The, the big trouble is that of the, the three and a half that you get, well, you don't get to choose mostly. Actually, some tool designer gets to choose chooses for you on your behalf, and, and you don't get much of a say in it, and that's not necessarily good, because the tool designer's incentive is not aligned necessarily with your incentive um, as an engineer or a developer. Why is it so hard then? Um, well, let's just look at the, the idealized workflow. So what I want is a tool that does this. I want to say to my tool, does my program have a bug? And I want the answer yes or no. Well, marvelous. Um, so my idealized workflow is the actual answer from the tool is yes or no. I get the, the correct positive or the correct negative every single time. Wouldn't that be marvellous? Um, because then what you do is, well, where the tool says, yep, there's a bug, you fix it, and you fix it immediately and now, 
and then you repeat until the tool says no, there are no more bugs, and then you're okay, and then you can ship your system, um, and you ship it knowing there are no bugs, and this is wonderful. Um, unfortunately, um, it ain't that simple. If any of you have ever used these tools, you'll know what's coming next. Um, if you want somebody to blame for this scenario, um, it's not the guy on the left. And I am, I'm assuming that some of the people watching this recognize the, the dude on the left. Um, I can't see you all on video now because I've got on in full screen mode, but I don't know if any of you recognize the, the chap on the right. Uh, the chap on the right uh, is called Kurt Gernel. He's an Austrian mathematician who, at the age of 25, uh, in 1931, produced something called the first incompleteness theorem, which basically says that there's stuff true in mathematics that's true, but you can't prove, uh, which really t overturned mathematics and, and caused a big um, earthquake in the world of maths in the 1930s. Um, if you put that, his incompleteness theorem, into a, a sort of washing machine and turn it around on spin for a couple of hours and add a Turing machine, you get something called Rice's theorem that says that determining non-trivial properties of a computer program is undecidable, and that's owing to a guy called Henry Gordon Rice, and that, that was done in 1951. The bottom line is, um, false positives are inevitable for determining non-trivial properties. Um, so a, a trivial property is something like indenting, uh, a non-trivial property is something like buffer overflow. Um, so false positives are inevitable. So if any tool vendor tells you their tool generates no false positives, they're, they're clearly talking nonsense. The other reason it's really hard is that the languages we're programming in don't actually have a completely well-defined meaning or semantics. Um, some, most of our programming languages, certainly the imperative languages, are ambiguous, uh, which means you basically don't know what they mean. Um, if you wish to illustrate this, go look at the, you know, the, the standard definition of C or, or, or C++, look in at the appendices, and you'll find a massive list of things which are said to be undefined or unspecified. Um, Three lines of code in this talk follow. There's an integer called i, uh, initialized to 6. There's an array of integers called a, 10 of them, which is initialized to something. And then I have this line of code. I, I is assigned to the i -th with post increment element of a. Uh, what does that mean? Oh, uh, I'm not sure. Um, if I do this with a big room of people, usually the room divides in three. You'll get one group of people who say, we know what it means. It means this and they think they know what it means. You have another group of people who will say, don't be stupid, it doesn't mean that, it means something else. Look, it means this. And you'll get about a third of the people who will say, I'm not sure what it means, um, uh, I might have to go look it up. Um, very rarely, very unfortunately, worryingly rarely, someone will say, ah, that is an undefined behavior. Um, if anyone can tell me why it's an undefined behavior, I'll, give you, I'll buy you a pint next time I see you. Um, but it's said to be an undefined behavior because we've got two side effects um, to the one object here, the, the post increment and the assignment, both the I, uh, are said to be undefined. This is appalling because what it means is the compiler can do whatever it damn well likes with this line of code. Uh, it could delete it, it could do anything, absolutely anything it likes, um, which for a compiler is fine. It can compile any other thing it likes, carry on, it doesn't issue a warning. And your program may or may not be seen to work. In fact, dangerously, it may seem to work fine when you test it, and you really don't know what it means. But for a static analysis tool, this is disastrous, because if a static analysis tool sees this line of code, it can only really do two things. It can either stop and say, your program is undefined, I cannot analyze this because I don't know what it means, which is truthful, but leads to you selling no tools, because the user will immediately respond, well, your tool's rubbish, because surely my code must be okay. Your tool must be crap, I'm not buying it. Um, so you lose the sale. Alternatively, the tool can guess what it means. The tool might say, well, it probably means this, and carry on with its analysis. The problem with that is that it's unsound, because if you guess wrong, you got the wrong results, and then you might be saying the program's okay when it's actually got a bug somewhere, and, yeah, yeah, and you get unsoundness or lots of false alarms as a result. So this is basically a, a disaster from the point of view of static analysis. Um, so that's why it's so hard. Basically, so what we actually get is this workflow. Um, you get both the false negative and the false positive, and you also get don't know answers, which you can interpret as false negatives or false positives, as you see fit. Um, so what do you do? Well, for the true positive, what actually tends to happen in industry is people don't always fix them. You might prioritize them. Um, you might defer defects. You may put them on the backlog to be fixed at some point in the future. 
Well, okay. Um, the false negative case is really bad. This is what we call unsound behaviour. So you, you know, the tool says, yeah, everything's fine, or I can't find any more bugs. So you may well just deploy the system with some unknown number of defects in it, and you might find them out later, you know, after you've shipped a million copies or something. Um, and, and in safety critical and security critical systems, this is important. You can't just say, oh, we'll ship you a patch, because you've crashed the aircraft, or you've lost all your customers' data, or you've, you know, destroyed the national infrastructure, or something. Okay, so in the worst case, these things are bad. Um, the false alarm case is really annoying, because the only thing you can do with false alarms is to basically sort of peer at them and decide if it's a false alarm or if it's a real bug, should you fix it? Or is it a false alarm actually not a bug? So you should then ignore that message for all, you know, uh, that's really annoying and actually costs you a lot of time and that, that costs you a lot of money as well. So this is kind of annoying. Um, so moving on to modes and, and depths of use, the kind of industrial uptake of these things. Basically, there seem to be two main styles, one very large, one not so big. The first style is called retrospective analysis. So this basically means you take your existing code base, whatever it is, or your pile of JavaScript or C++ or whatever, Objective-C or Swift, and you chuck it into one of these static analysis tools, and that tool will find probably some of the bugs, um, and there will be probably some or lots of false alarms. Um, that's just the way it is. Uh, the, the good stuff about this, this sort of mode of usage, I suppose, it's, it's easy to sell the tool for tool vendor, as long as the tool is capable of reading the worst program ever written, um, and that's a serious engineering challenge, it's easy to sell tools. Um, it's easiest adoption for users, you just chuck code into the tool and magic happens, right? And that's easy, there's no real process or discipline change required. Um, the, the, on the flips, on the, on, the, on the poor side of these things, all of the tools in this part of the market are unsound because they all favour guess what the program means rather than, than stopping these undefined behaviours. Um, the false alarm rate can be extremely high uh, and annoying. You don't really get much beyond looking for dumb bugs with these tools. They all kind of stop out at looking for the dumb stuff like buffer overflows and don't go much further. And they can require you to stick the whole program in, which, as I said, can be very slow. And it also tends to come late in the day, which is, which is annoying. The market for these tools is enormous. Um, there are some very big players in this part of the sector because that's where the money is to be made because there's billions of lines of crappy code out there to analyse. Um, so that's where the big market lies. The flip side is the constructive analysis. Um, so the idea here is that we analyse all the code all the time. From day one, for all new code, at least, for all the new code that we write, we're going to analyze it all the time and try and keep the number of defects down to pretty much zero all the time. Um, this also involves stuff like the discipline use of language subsets. So I hope on your development projects you've all got some sort of coding standard. You either have one written down or you've got one in your head somewhere. Um, well, imagine taking your coding standard and turning the dial up so that you design the language subset to match what the verification tool is really good at, and you stick to that subset, you get much more bang for the buck. And we also use these things called contracts, so preconditions and assertions in the code, um, to, to help the tool and to tell the tool what we want to do. With this approach, you can get much closer to the big five goals, about 4.9. The missing point one, of course, is the inevitability of false alarms. Um, on the negative side, this a style is much harder to adopt because you have to make a big decision early in a project to say, right, we're going to adopt a nice strict coding standard or a language subset or whatever. Um, and you may have to make a really big decision, like saying, well, actually, we're not going to use C, we're going to use Rust. We're not going to use Objective-C, we're going to use Swift. Because these more modern languages are much better in this regard um, than the sort of 1970s, 1980s era languages. Um, so this type of analysis is mostly found in the safety and security critical uh, market, which is where, where I'm, I've worked all these years. Um, what can we verify? Okay, so a brief sort of playing field then. Um, on first base, we just did what we call basic hygiene. So this is what we would call syntactic rules, like, oh, don't use go to. You know, uh, that's just real dumb basic stuff. Coding style, indenting a layout. And of course, you will compile with compiler warnings and type checking turned up to the max. Compiler warnings and type checking are just a basic form of static analysis. We always have their maxed out, um, <coughs> which is standard. At second base, you kind of move on to the implicit dumb bugs. 
stuff like don't have uninitialized variables because that's undefined behavior in most of our languages. Um, and then there's sort of patterns of stuff that's usually probably wrong. There's something called taint analysis, which is trying to trace you know, uh, unvalidated input through the information flowing programs. Yeah, that kind of stuff's okay. It tends to be a bit guessy, a bit heuristic, can have a high false alarm rate. But third base, we move up to stuff like buffer overflow, uh, arithmetic overflow is pretty tricky to deal with. Um, and then there's these slew of these sort of nasty, horrible, undefined behaviors that we want to get rid of. Um, concurrency is oh, a nightmare, dealing with threading and tasks and, you know, um, and dealing with just generally concurrent programming is a massive bag of worms here. And up at fourth base, we get to the really fun stuff, which is basically allowing the user to say what they want verified by using these contracts and assertions to say, you know, at this point in the program, this must always be true, and you get to choose what you want verified. Um, that means, God forbid, you have to go away and think about what you want verified. So you can't just tick a box and say, yes, I've done this coding standard. You actually have to go away and think about your requirements, which is kind of a radical concept for you agile people. <laughs> um, so a very brief tour, then, of some languages and tools. Um, this is incredibly incomplete because I'm so constrained for time. Um, so the big retrospective toolbar that I mentioned earlier, um, so all of these tools that are essentially retrospective, they are all unsound, they are all incomplete, have false positives a certain amount. Um, they're all pretty much limited to third base. None of these tools are going to the kind of user-defined assertions stuff. Um, but there's a big market. So this market is dominated by companies like Coverity, Fortify, Clockwork, uh, Grammar Tech, Capital Code Sonar, Programming Research based in the UK have been in the market a long time with QAC and QAC++. Uh, an older player in the market is Gimple with PC Lit, and so on and so on. There are lots and lots of tools in this market. Um, lots of them claiming to find security bugs in your code. Security is really sexy at the moment, obviously. Safety isn't so sexy, so lots of them are focusing on the security vulnerabilities kind of stuff. Um, they're just bugs, nothing special about them. Um, one you should really go play with is Facebook's in third or Facebook bought a company that spun out of Queen Mary uh, College in East London. They developed this tool that came on to be called Infer, and it's used internally at Facebook, but they've since open sourced it um, so that it's free to use. The, the development's also on GitHub, so you can see what they're doing. Um, it's capable of analyzing Java and, and C and, and C++ and Objective-C. Um, it is particularly good at finding pointer-related bugs, which are particularly difficult to deal with. Um, in this world. So Facebook Infer is a, is a particularly interesting tool that is, is free to play with if you want to have a crack with it and see what you get. It's, it's an interesting piece of tech. And actually designed and built by the Facebook engineering team in London. Um, these guys from Queen, Queen Mary did it. It's very cool. Um, the last one is the one I'm most familiar with, the one I've been a user of all these years. It's called Spark um, with a K. I need to say it's not Apache Spark. I wish Apache would go away and stop using our name because we thought of it first. Um, this is the high end. This is designed to be unambiguous and constructive and sound. So this is a language we use in gen engines and so on. Um, Rolls Voice, for example, we use it. Um, it's a subset of Ada, which is the most unfashionable programming language in the entire universe, but don't worry about it. Um, it is incidentally open source, so it's free to use if you want to go grab it. Um, and just incidentally, if you've flown in about the UK in the last five years, you've been a Spark user because a very significant chunk of the UK air traffic control infrastructure is written in it and verified using this technology. So you, you are one of our customers, I promise you. Um, in summary then, I'm looking at the time, important golden rule is garbage in, garbage out. Um, if you try to analyze a crappy program, you will find out that it's crappy and nothing more. Um, and you'll get lots of false alarms. No tool will make your rubbishy code less rubbishy. Um, it's up to you to learn how to design code that is verifiable, and that takes a bit of go. You know, you have to put some effort into that to learn how to design code so that verification tools will do a good job on it um, over and above just testing. The other golden rule is there's no verification without specification, which means beyond the dumb bucks, beyond the buffer overflows and uninitialized variables and all the stupid stuff, um, you have to decide what you want verified. It's your application, it's your program, it's your customer. You need to be able to write down what you want verified. And if you're going to write it down and have a tool, a computer, check it, you've got to write it down in a formal language. 
There's no other way you can do it. A computer is a formal machine. You can't describe it. You can't read it or requirements in English yet. Um, so don't be afraid of the maths. The, the, these ideas of using assertions and stuff is very cool. But there is some work required. There's, there's no free lunch. Um, so homework to finish then. Um, if you want to follow up. Firstly, I strongly commend to you an article in CACM from 2010 that was written by the, the guys that founded the Coverity um, company. It's called A Billion Lines of Code Later. Um, this article in CACM is all about how they built the tool, how they built the Coverity uh, analysis tool. Uh, and it's very honest. It's very sort of warts and all accounts of the engineering challenge in basically building a tool that can read in the worst C programs ever written, because that's what they had to do um, to deal with all the junk that's out there. Um, and it's a really, really interesting account of how they did it. Um, homework assignment two, if you feel more like you want to have a play, go grab Facebook and Fur, uh, fbinfer.com, and have a play, see what it finds. You might be surprised what it can do. Um, and the third assignment is don't believe the marketing stuff. Um, put your code into one of these tools and see what you get. And as a result of that, what would you change about your development style or your programming style or your coding standard or your, you know, what tools you're using? You know, what would you improve is an interesting idea. So there's a few things you might consider doing. Um, obviously, since we're online, I have to have a gratuitous cat photo. Um, I hope that cat is tapping away and blinking at you online. Um, at that point, I will stop and say, are there any questions?